Excellent, Alessandro. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are very pleased to, to welcome you to this um, webinar from uh, virtually from Tokyo, from our uh, law firm member Ivata Goto, and in particular, we thank very much Akira Matsuda, the expert on data protection and data privacy from, from this law firm. My name is Andrea Chmielinski Bigazzi. I have the pleasure of being the coordinator of the Global Alliance of uh, Data Privacy Experts called Privacy Rules. Uh, we are present in 53 jurisdictions worldwide with a very strong base of uh, passionate lawyers, experts in all data privacy matters. Uh, we are present in all continents. As you can understand, we are speaking to you from, um, from the Americas, from Europe and from Asia, showing that no matter what the hour is, we are ready to assist you in any matter related to data protection. What privacy rules, privacy rules do, actually we assist um, any company that has problems related to data protection on a timely and effective fashion everywhere in the world. Our network of experts is uh, highly interconnected. So may you have problems related to an international data transfer, which is one of the topics today, or a data breach, both from the prevention side and the response side, we are ready to assist you all around the clock. Uh, yesterday, we had our annual conference and we launched the partnership program for cybersecurity companies. This program is chaired by one of the speakers today, Ken Morris from the US, from a cybersecurity company. So we are ready to welcome cybersecurity companies on board of our alliance in order to be in the condition to assist you not only from the legal side, but also from the cybersecurity side. This is the vision and the mandate, in fact, of privacy rules. We will be here together with two fantastic sessions, one related to international data transfers and the other one related to um, data breach uh, prevention and response. I don't want to take much of your time. I just invite you all who are in the audience to submit questions through the Q&A uh, function or the chat function, if you prefer, at the very bottom of this page. And we will uh, propose these questions to our panelists at the very end of these two sessions. The word goes immediately to the virtual host of today's event, again, Akira Matsuda from the law firm Ivata Godo in Japan. Thank you very much for being there in the audience and thanks very much to all our speakers today. Akira. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, as introduced, my name is Akira Matsuda. Uh, I belong to, a, I'm a partner of a law firm called Ivata Godo. We are an independent law firm based in Tokyo, uh, offering full service. And today, uh, this is a virtual conference, but virtually we are gathering in Tokyo. We are still 3 p.m. here now, so it's in the afternoon, but because we are entering into uh, the evening shortly, my background is this is a Tokyo station virtually. And actually, I'm currently in my office, which is located in front of the Tokyo station. So I'm looking down on the Tokyo station and hosting this conference. So as to session one, uh, we'll focus on the international data transfer today. We do have uh, four members on the panel. Uh, EU1, who is the Managing Director, Taylor Swintervia from Singapore. Uh, Mr. Jihon Chen, who is an equity partner at Zhongzhou Law Firm from China, Beijing. And we do have uh, Ms. Anieska Mirosinska Korzeska, partner at WKB Lawyers from Poland and also Mr. Kim Walker, a partner from Shakespeare Martino, law firm based in London. So before starting, I would like to ask each of the panels to introduce themselves and also to, to let us know what is the key takeaway or the key themes that they focus on today's, uh, in today's panel. So uh, Yingyu, can, can you start, please? Sure. Hi, my name is Ying. Um, I hate the Singapore practice of Taylor Vintage Fire. We pre primarily support innovative businesses and entrepreneurs. And personally, uh, my passion, passion in practice um, is related to technology issues such as data, regulation work, intellectual property, commercial negotiations. And I'm very happy to be here today with my peers from different countries. Look forward to uh, fun-filled talk. Thank you very much, In. Uh, next, uh, Jihon, could you go ahead, please? 
Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you, Akira. I'm Ji Hong Chen and a part of the Jun Law Firm. As you may know, the Jun Law Firm is a full search law firm headquartered in Beijing. We have uh, uh, over 10 domestic offices and a few overseas offices. And uh, one office is located in Tokyo. Uh, I mainly practice uh, data protection, cybersecurity, and telecoms law. Very nice to have the chance to each interview with, with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jihong. Then, uh, Anieska, please. Good morning uh, from Poland. Uh, my name is Agnieszka wirczynska kruszewska um, and I'm a partner at WKP Law Firm. I'm heading the IP data privacy uh, practice in the law firm, and we're also a full service firm uh, covering um, Poland. Uh, and I'm happy to represent uh, EU um, although still uh, we have the UK member, uh, which is still also the EU. So, <laughs> Kim, hello. Thank you. Yes, I'm, uh, thank you, Agnieszka. Thank you, Akira. Um, hello from London. I'm Kim Walker. I'm a partner in Shakespeare Martineau. Um, we are a full service law firm in the UK with nine offices around the country. Um, and uh, I specialize in technology and information law. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about uh, how Brexit may or may not affect the transfer of data around the, uh, around the world um, from the end of the transition period in a few weeks time. Thank you, Kim. So now I would like to pose uh, questions to each of the uh, uh, panelists specify, uh, focusing on their own jurisdictions. But before starting, uh, as you may know, uh, Singapore is an uh, APAC data center hub. So Ian will be focusing on the compliance issues, uh, especially uh, from the viewpoint that Singapore is, many, many companies are using Singapore as an APAC data center hub. And as to Jihon, uh, from a, a Chinese law professionals, uh, he, he will be focusing on a draft personal information protection law, which impact the cross-border restriction uh, out, out from China to outside China. And Anieska and Kim, uh, UK is still the uh, uh, e still remaining in the EU for the time being, but uh, the the transition period is almost over, and but. UK has an identical uh, regulation regime with, with regard as to GDPR. So uh, for Kim, uh, we, we would like to know uh, what, what's the effect of the Brexit. And as to Agnieszka, after UK leaves EU, uh, it's clear that the Poland is the only uh, EU remaining country in this panel. So we would like to, uh, I would like to ask her about the uh, impact of the C uh, recent CJEU's Schremer's two decision, uh, which may have an impact on the cross-border transfer from uh, EU to outside the EU. So I'm gonna start asking a question to Ian, who is the uh, co-chair of the Privacy Rules Asian Committee. One of the most important topics related to data protection is the one related to pro processes like responsibilities. What are the obligations of a data processor based in Singapore when it comes to foreign personal data? Hi, thanks. Um, based on the, equal, uh, the, the law itself, which is PDPA in Singapore, the processor doesn't really have a lot of obligations. It's namely security and retention. Um, but obviously, in, in reality, we know that uh, a lot of the data processes, depending on bargaining power, will contractually have to take on quite a bit more obligations. Um, I think uh, one of the trickier issues I have seen is um, multinational companies having many many different um, entities and had designated one of these entities as a data processor in Singapore. I think um, in situations like this, I am not sure whether um, 
in name being a data processor is sufficient uh, to fulfill the obligation because obviously the commission, the PDPC, um, takes a very um, um, takes a very realistic and practical view. If the data processor crosses into a data controller, then all of the obligations will apply. But having said that, in general, again, um, I think the PDPC takes quite a business-friendly approach. But in the same time, because we are promoting ourself, um, ourselves as a data center hub, we need to make sure that um, the baseline uh, protection is there. So. Um, there, there are quite a lot of advancement and developments in this year alone. For example, um, one of the main ones I think would be the um, accepting of cross-border privacy rules system certified um, entities um, as, a, uh, as, a, as an entity that, that provides the same baseline protection as Singapore. So Japan, US, Korea, um, these are all countries that are in that are part of this uh, um, um, treaty. So it, it is actually really good for us because um, what it means is that um, in, from an MNC perspective, they can easily shift data from one country to another without having to prove that the standard of care, is, that the duty is the same. Um, the other uh, amendments to the Personal Data Protection Act in Singapore. Um, they have been passed just a, about a month ago. And um, we do not know when they will take effect yet. It will definitely be within a year. But um, those amendments also have quite a bit of impact in um, data transfer, uh, which will um, obviously then uh, affect the obligations of a data processor. But I was thinking perhaps we can touch on that later. Um, when we talk about uh, new developments. Thank you very much, uh, Inu. Uh, Inu touched a very important topic on the uh, APEX ABPR regime, which is a, a free flow of data, which is intended to ensure the free flow of data transfer among the uh, APEC region. So uh, when we focus on the international data transfer, uh, when we advise, when I advise the uh, our client is first starting from a mapping of a data transfer, international data transfer, uh, which comprises of uh, categories of what categories of data are transferred, is it within the group or outside the group, and the relationship is controller or processor. Japan has adopted a cross. Japan has adopted a consent-based approach on a cross-border transfer restriction. So for a transfer to a non-white list country or non, a transfer not based on the APEC CBPR regime, you need to basically obtain the consent of the data subject. If you, are, if you are not to obtain the consent of the data subject, you need to prove that there is an adequate protection if you transfer the data cross border So this can be realized either by entering to a data transfer agreement or enter into a, a, or installing a inter, a mutual internal rules, which is very much identical to uh, SCC and BCR arrangements under the uh, GDPR. So this is a very uh, basic understanding of the approach that are taken in Japan. So now uh, turning into China, uh, Jihon, who is also the uh, co-chair of the Privacy Rules Asian Committee, if a Japanese company operates in China, what is the general advice to foreign companies doing business in China for data protection? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Akro. I think this was quite an interesting question. And uh, I would like to give a, a few tips for uh, business uh, in China. The first one is on to you that uh, compared with uh, GDPR or the legal regime in Japan, uh, China's legal regime and regarding cybersecurity and data protection is quite complicated and with uh, multi layers of legislation and namely laws by National People's Congress and regulation by the State Council and department rules by the ministries. And uh, these multi layers and standard uh, laws bring difficulties and challenges for a company to comply with. And uh, you need to consider uh, different sources for 
a complaint. So this is a challenge for in-house counsel. Uh, <clears throat> secondly, I want to tell you tell about liability. In some countries, in the, the civil litigation or civil liability uh, is a major remedy for this subject. But on the contrary, in China, and administrative enforcement and uh, is uh, including the CEC, MIT, and uh, MPS are quite aggressive and or active. I take an example in, the, in this year, and a special enforcement uh, activity was taken by the government named on applications. And the, the government checked 1,000 plus applications and determined where they have uh, illegal <coughs> contacts of uh, collection, use or transfer. If they found any illegal contacts, they will order the police operators to rectify of all the fine, mandatory fines. It's quite uh, aggressive. Uh, certainly, I need want you want you to understand one special uh, understanding the, the the special requirements of identity and Chinese legal regime. Actually, uh, and Chinese legal regime and the, the two general identity for a company and the one is network operator, another one is CIO, a critical information infrastructure, infrastructure operators. Uh, generally speaking, and all the companies, including the foreign investor company in China, are uh, very likely con considered as uh, network operators, but it was, was less likely, le was le less likely to be regarded as a CIO. And it's, Network operators so bear the basic uh, cybersecurity and uh, data protection liability, but CIO so bear the higher level of liabilities. Uh, third, and um, you must understand the MLPS scheme, multi level protection scheme in China, uh, depending on the importance of the nature of the net networks and each network in China should be classified into five levels from level one to level five. And the high level means the higher standard for cybersecurity liability merits for the technical merits, et cetera. And after you uh, classified the, the, the system, you must file, file the record with the local uh, 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 public security bureau. Uh, first, and uh, you need to understand the uh, security review system. And it will provide a service or products to the CIO. Your products or service may subject to the cyber security review by the government. Uh, finally, and most uh, many uh, company concern about the VPN use, usage in China. I just want to tell you that uh, uh, use VPN in China is a lot, but subject to the law requirements, for example, you must uh, lease the lands from the three basic tel telecom providers, named China Telecom, China Mobile, and China Unicom. You cannot lease uh, lease lands from other providers. And the purpose for the VPN usage only for the uh, daily operation or self usage. You cannot and provide a commercial service to the third party. Across, it is a general guidance for the company in China to be compliant with uh, cybersecurity and data protection. Thank you very much, Ji Hong. Uh, notably, Russia and China are the two countries globally which has a strict uh, cross-border transfer restriction. And it's, it's always an issue for companies when they're operating there and how to comply with the local regulations. So we will come back to uh, Chinese regulation data on practical tips on how to comply with the, uh, uh, those, those uh, cross-border transfer restrictions. Thank you, Ji Hong. So next okay. we, uh, we, we, we fly to Europe. So uh, two jurisdictions, Poland and UK. So starting from Poland, uh, so uh, Agnieszka. Now, after the departure of UK from the EU, you are the only one uh, fully within the EU in this panel. So how, 
I would like to ask you, how does the SHRAMS 2 decision uh, affect the transfers of personal data to countries other than the US? Um, yes, thank you. I think that I'll start with uh, a little bit of the background of how the system works. Uh, we use the name SHRAMS decision, but of course for some people uh, and some of our viewers and listeners, it might be a mystery name. So I'll give a little bit of the background. Um, so the countries in the European Union um, created a unified system of data protection. Um, so we based the system on the regulation GDPR, which applies to all the countries in the EU uh, in the same way. And not only the system is created in a way that it applies in the European Union countries, but it also affects the transfer to third countries because it protects the uh, data, the personal data of uh, data subjects, citizens of the European Union. Um, the European Union also created um, the Court of Justice of the European Union that um, decides issues referred to it by the national courts. Um, so the court really helps to achieve the unified interpretation of the European rules. So generally, the transfer of data, and we're especially talking about the EU, US, um, because the man who was behind the whole case, Maximilian Schrems, uh, an Austrian citizen, uh, he was campaigning against the transfer of personal data from the European Union to Facebook, located in the United States. Um, the case was initiated in Ireland, um, as the Facebook European base is in Ireland. Um, and the main concern of Mr. Schrems was that the data being transferred to the United States um, may be um, taken over uh, by the National Security Agency. So basically by our, the, your American agencies that um, are responsible for um, safety and security uh, of the United States um, as a country. Um, so Mr. Schrem said that based on uh, the current regime in the European Union, uh, the data should not be transferred. So the data to the United States was transferred based on so-called privacy shield program, uh, which, is what, which, is no, which was not really the accreditation of the United States as a country, as a safe country to transfer the data, but it actually allowed certain companies to register and the companies, individual companies, were considered as those safe um, recipients of the data. So following the complaint of Mr. Schrems, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union decided that Mr. Schrems was right um, and the Privacy Shield program should not longer exist as the legitimate ground for the data transfer uh, to the United States. But in the second decision, meaning the Schrems II decision, the court also decided that the model contractual clauses, which were the basis for the transfer outside um, of the European Union, regardless of the country, so not on the US, um, is a valid ground to transfer the data, uh, but the party who is transferring the data should make sure that even though it uses the model clauses, but it has to verify whether the recipient country is actually fulfilling uh, the fundamental rights um, that the data subjects in the European Union uh, would have here. So this is a general view of the Schrems decision. So it actually impacted um, the data transfer, international data transfers in two ways. I mean, first of all, it abolished the um, privacy shield program, but this is only relating to the transfer to the US, but it also um, made higher requirements to use the model contractual clauses in the contracts, not only to, for the transfer to the US, but to the transfer to any other countries outside of the European Union. Thank you very much, uh, Nieska. Uh, you raise a very uh, interesting point on the uh, effectiveness of the SCC that, that's uh, referred to in the uh, uh, 
Streamers 2 decision. Uh, in Japan, we also, as I explained, uh, it is very typical for a company to enter into a data transfer agreement to comply with our own, uh, Japan's own data transfer restrictions. But up to now, we, we haven't seen a practice by our data protection authority to, to check whether the agreement is effectively enforced or is it effective, uh, effectively effective upon the, uh, in the recipient countries. And I believe the SureMS2 decision will impact our practice in Japan in the near future that the effectiveness of these data transfer agreement or how the uh, sender or the, uh, uh, those who is transferring data outside to Japan is managing uh, these agreements that's already entered into with the recipient. So now Kim, uh, UK still after, I mean, I, I don't say still, but even after the uh, departure from the EU, uh, we believe that UK is one of the uh, leading uh, world economics, including the including the data related businesses. So many of our clients are concerned uh, once the Brexit transition period is over within a few weeks, what the effect that, that might have uh, with regard to the data that is uh, transferred out of in and out of the UK, how should businesses which carry on business with the UK be prepared for the uh, end of the transition period? Thank you, Akira. Uh, there will be an important implications for businesses that uh, do business with the UK through Europe. Um, so when the Brexit transition period ends on the 31st of December, in a few weeks time, the GDPR won't apply in the UK anymore because it's a European law and the UK won't be bound by European laws any further. But in order to ensure that um, there isn't any uh, or there aren't any unnecessary barriers to trade between the UK and the rest of Europe, um, what the UK is going to do is going to put uh, the GDPR into UK national law. So the GDPR will become uh, UK law. So there'll be two GDPRs. There'll be a UK GDPR and an EU GDPR, one applying to the processing of data um, of UK citizens and one applying to the processing of data of the citizens of the rest of the EU. Um, so on the 1st of, the Jul 1st, 1st of January next year, there'll be two GDPRs and they'll be virtually identical. So you'd think um, that nothing or not much would change as far as cross-border um, transfers of data are concerned. And, and you'd be right as far as transfers from the UK are concerned. So transfers of data out of the UK will continue as before. So transfers to countries where there's, a, there's an adequacy decision um, will continue as, as before, and there'll be no need to put um, standard contractual clauses, as Agnieszka was mentioning, in place. Um, and countries that, in, that, that have an adequacy decision include Japan, and um, the 12 or so other countries where the EU's uh, declared that their data protection laws are sufficient to protect the rights of, of EU citizens. Um, and the UK is going to continue to recognise those adequacy decisions. So flows of data out of the UK will be generally unaffected by Brexit. Um, the news, however, is not quite so good for uh, data flows in the other direction into the UK because from the 1st of January 2021 um, businesses in the UK uh, sorry businesses in the EU won't be able to transfer data into the UK without the appropriate safeguards that Agnieszka was talking about um, such as the model clauses the standard contractual clauses um, and this is because the European Commission looks very unlikely between now and the 31st of December to issue an adequacy decision. Uh, they're unlikely to um, dis decide that the UK's data protection laws are sufficient to protect the rights of EU citizens. So that this means that, that businesses in the UK and in the EU who want to continue to do business together um, and where, where the transfer of personal data into the UK is concerned, 
they're going to need to put the standard contractual clauses in place uh, and they're going to have to do that quite quickly and uh, the same applies to groups of companies which have subsidiaries in the UK and Europe they're also going to need to put um, some appropriate safeguards in place the standard contractual clauses so businesses should be looking at their data flows now looking at cloud service suppliers in Europe that they use um, that, that, that um, deal with UK data, um, IT platforms, HR service suppliers, um, group companies in the UK and in Europe, uh, UK businesses doing uh, are targeting U EU consumers um, and UK businesses processing data on behalf of EU companies and they should, should be putting the standard contractual clauses in place. Um, so there's potentially quite a lot for, for companies to do, especially as new standard contractual clauses have just been published by the EU, um, which uh, are going to take a little while to, to get in place. So there really won't mu be much time to do this. Um, there are a few other things that will, will need to happen as a result of Brexit, such as appointing EU representatives, but in my opinion, the getting the standard contractual clauses in place is by far the most urgent. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, interesting observation. Uh, as, as this Brexit situation is very unique in the UK and not for the uh, other current EU member states. So uh, we, we had uh, uh, very interesting considerations already from these uh, five different jurisdictions. And one comment from myself is that the cross-border transfer uh, requires a localization of a compliance structuring. So what this is meant is that uh, as regards to the cross-border transfer of personal data, the uh, regulation jurisdiction of the law to be uh, imposed is the uh, uh, location of the uh, transferring parties. So th this means that, uh, for example, a Japanese head uh, corporations based in Tokyo, headquarters in Tokyo, uh, when they are exporting data from Tokyo, they only need to comply with the Japanese law. But once they have operations in several jurisdictions, and they are re-importing or exporting data from those jurisdictions to Japan, in this case, uh, the laws to be applied is not the Japanese law, but the, uh, uh, each jurisdiction's uh, regulation. In this case, the, the most frequent question asked is, in case if you comply with the Japanese regulation, does this mean that uh, you are uh, at the same time complying with uh, other jurisdictions cross-border transfer restriction? And this is, needs to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and this makes a complication on the compliance structuring or the uh, cost or work to be uh, done in case you are complying, in case you are operating in many, many jurisdictions. So coming back to Singapore, uh, we have a bit discussed that APEC CBPR regime and broadening the discussions to the APEC rules, which are relevant for Japan uh, when they are operating in APEC region. What are the recent or ongoing legal developments that are significant to Singapore as an APEC data center hub? Um, thanks, Akira. Uh, I, in Singapore, prior to the amendments, it's, it's very similar to Japan in terms of transfer obligations. Um, basically, it's consent and then um, ensuring that it's the same standard, either by way of rules, contract, or the CV, uh, CVPR uh, certification. Um, but the amendments have brought about two very interesting exemptions. The first one is a legitimate interest exception. So um, the consent is not required if, if it is uh, consent of the data subject is not required for transfer if it, if it is reasonable um, to, to, to not uh, to use uh, or to collect that data. So, so that I think um, it's, it's, it's less it's probably more difficult to prove. It's the second exemption that I'm a lot more interested in and, and that has actually concerned a lot of my, well, that has already interest a lot of my clients. Um, the second exemption is the business improvement exception. 
So um, this really works in favor of international companies um, because if you can prove that as a group, the use of this data will improve the service or the goods, um, or even if it's understanding the behavior of the data subjects, um, you can actually transfer the data out to a following, uh, to, to a related entity without receiving consent. So um, I think this, this, is a, this is an interesting play because that makes moving data in and out of Singapore um, rather easy. <laughs> Of course, within the constraints, but but it is um, extremely beneficial, I think, to to companies that have a very strong data play, um, to have their data census here, right, and then to process it. Say in let's say if their if their data scientists are seated in Indonesia, they can then transfer it to Indonesia to that entity. Of course, subject to security, etc. But but um, I think that this is a a pretty a pretty um, business friendly <laughs> amendment uh, and and of course it's balanced with with um, the PDPC increasing potential fines to to ten percent of turnover which which is a huge jump uh, because previously in Singapore the cap is at one million uh, so I think they try to strike a balance um, and I think this this business improvement exception it's it's a it's it's a very interesting development, and I'm actually discussing that with a lot of my clients now. Yeah. Thank you very much, Inu. Uh, this is very interesting that Singapore is always taking a very business friendly approach uh, as to 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 uh, ensure its position as a hub in the Southeast Asia region, and it's all, uh, it's the same as to the data data world. So uh, I believe China is taking a very different approach from uh, Singapore. And I would like to ask Ji Hon uh, on uh, uh, the business in China. How can a company legally transfer data outside of China? Yeah, OK. Uh, thank you, Akira. And uh, for a long time, and the regulation on the cross-border data transfer is, is quite uncertain. And as we know that uh, Chinese first uh, compre compre comprehensive law, cyber security law, uh, was coming into force on the 2017. In the cyber security law, they just provides a very general guide for the uh, cross-border data transfer regarding the CIO. For data collected by a CIO in China, and the CIO must store the data in China. And if the CIO wish to transfer data to overseas countries and are security assessment must be conducted. It is a very general rules on the cross-border data transfer. After the subsequent law in 2017, and the, the, the CEC and, uh, was published, uh, published a few draft guide for the cross-border data transfer, but they are very controversial. But in this year, I mean in 2020, and the uh, National People's Congress published the, the personal information protection law dropped for the first time. And this law, this draft law provides a whole picture regarding the regulation on the cross-border transfer in China. And in this law, and the, uh, the uh, draft law provides a, a general rules on conducting data transfer in China. And it, actually there are three legal approach. The first one is a security assessment by the government and if the CIO uh, wish to, wishes to transfer any data to overseas countries or uh, a network operator, uh, but the score of the information processed is up to the amount specified by the, the CC, and uh, the CIO or the network operators must pass the security assessment organized by the government. The first approach is uh, the governmental assessment. And second way is uh, having and taking personal information protection certification uh, conducted by the professional agency. Of course, agency must be approved by the, the government. So the second way is uh, certification. And the third way, I think it should be the, uh, the most common way is contract. 
they are having signed a contract uh, between the uh, date sending party and uh, the, the overseas receiving party. And it, it is a, it's similar to the GDPR SEC, but beside the SEC, there's a few conditions for the, the contract. First one is beside the SEC, beside the contract and the sending party need to secure a separate consent from the data subject. And before the conducting the transfer and a security assessment must be uh, uh, must be conducted, and the result, I mean the risk, must be a lower or the controllable. And also, uh, 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 and also the uh, and the data sending parties has an obligation to supervise the data receiving party and make sure that the data receiving party can reach the level required by the contract. So you can see even we have the contract and the requirements it were were very high. And this is a were general rules for the data cross-border transfer. Besides the general rules, we have special rules for the uh, special categories of uh, data. In China, so for the financial personal information and health and care personal information and for the credit personal information, they need to follow the special rules for the cross-border transfer. Okay, well, it is just a introduction about Chinese regulation on the cross-border data transfer. Thank you very much. Uh, the clarification is very welcome from globally, uh, as there were no sub legislation or guideline before. But uh, maybe we need to ask Ji Hong for a specific advice because it's very complicated, uh, as you can see from what, what he, he uh, explains in general, at, uh, at least at this stage. Okay, uh, let's fly back to Europe as our time is now limited. So let's go back to Poland. And Anietzka, we, we again come back to C CJEU's decision impact. And what's the impact of the uh, Schirmer's two decision uh, on transfers within the group companies? And what are the re recommended steps to keep the data transfers as in general terms? Um, the the, the, the Schrems decision, um, as I mentioned before, it really relates to such data transfer also within um, group companies, if such transfers were based on the privacy shield. Um, so basically, it only relates to the EU, um, e, the EU US transfers. Um, so in all other respects, um, the intra-group transfers uh, were not really impacted uh, by the Schrems decision, except for the situation where the intra-group transfers were um, established based on the contractual clauses, where of course the Schrems decision requires that there is an additional assessment requirement that uh, the recipients of the data uh, based on the model contractual clauses um, are also fulfilling the adequate protection uh, measures um, in, in the recipient country. Um, so for all other intra-group transfers, all the rules that are established based on um, the GDPR are still in place. Um, so basically the, the binding corporate rules, so this is one of the uh, basis for, for the intra-group transfer. So the group companies may establish uh, binding corporate rules and get them approved by the um, EU authorities, so the um, appropriate um, um, data protection authorities in a specific country. Uh, but also, um, as it was mentioned earlier, um, in many cases, uh, companies use the consent um, me mechanism, so they um, try to obtain the consents from the data subjects in order to uh, legally transfer data even within the group um, to a third country. Um, many, many companies use the processing agreements as well, um, so they don't really transfer the data um, to a third company, to a third country, uh, but they use processing mechanism, um, so the, 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 the company within the group um, is only processing um, the agreements. Um, so probably coming back a little bit to the Schrems decision, um, we don't really see a huge impact um, on the intra-group um, agreements and intra-group um, arrangements. Um, the, the, the Schrems decision really 
um, may impact some of the US uh, transfers. So for example, um, the Polish Data Protection Authority um, has just initiated the investigation um, into some companies transferring uh, data to Google based on the Google Analytics um, technology, um, trying to investigate whether companies after the Schrems decision implemented certain measures um, in order um, to make it legal uh, for the Google Analytics um, to have the data transferred um, to the US. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Anitska. Uh, so the last question to Kim in the UK. So uh, now uh, UK is uh, adopting the GDPR into UK law. And why is the EU requiring uh, the additional compliance steps to UK as you explained previously? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, and I think the answer is that um, although the UK GDPR and the EU GDPR are almost word for word identical, so you'd think there wouldn't be a problem. There are all kinds of other UK laws that the European Commission uh, doesn't particularly like um, when it's doing its, its assessment of adequacy. Um, most of these are sort of national security laws, surveillance laws, um, brought in for anti-terrorism purposes and that kind of thing. And these laws are no longer subject to the EU national security exemptions, which enable the European Commission to overlook similar laws in other EU countries. Uh, because the UK is no longer part of the EU, it can't overlook these laws when it's looking at adequacy. Um, and the European Court also recently decided that certain um, mass or bulk data uh, collection um, laws in place in the UK, France and Belgium were contrary to EU fundamental rights. So again, that's preventing an adequacy decision. And they have other concerns as well. For example, now that the UK isn't bound by European law, theoretically, the GDPR could over time uh, move away from the EU GDPR and be diluted so that, uh, you know, perhaps as part of the UK negotiations to get a deal with the US. Um, so the EU, I think, is worried that data will be moved from the UK to the US. Um, where uh, more easily, where, where, where obviously data protection laws are still or currently comparatively weak. Um, I mean, this, the lack of an adequacy decision is a, is a real problem for the UK because um, the need to, to go through all these uh, additional compliance steps are pretty, um, pretty expensive. I think it's been estimated that it's going to cost the UK about one point, or UK businesses, about 1.6 billion pounds um, to get. Uh, all these additional compliance um, uh, requirements in place. So ultimately, it feels to me anyway, as though the whether an adequacy decision is granted or not, is going to be partly a political decision. Um, and that will probably depend on whether the EU and the, U and the UK manage to agree a trade deal um, in the next few weeks. Um, and negotiations on that are obviously still ongoing. Thank you very much, Kim. So uh, based on what we have heard from the panels, it seems that the uh, cross-border, this world, the cross-border transfer restriction of the personal data uh, is rapidly changing and being updated in many of the jurisdictions. The import important point is to keep up with the changes in the regulation and to catch up or update the compliance structuring. And when you are updating the compliance structuring or the, the taking the compliance steps, always the importance comes back to the data mapping and whether the relationship is controller controller or the controller uh, processor, because the uh, processing activities uh, ha has a diff in many jurisdictions different approach or different uh, sets of obligations, and also whether the transfer is intra-group or uh, transferred, being transferred to outside the group would make a, a huge difference in many of the jurisdictions. Uh, it is very difficult to, to extract the core principles that are applicable to every of the jurisdiction, because as you may heard, uh, every jurisdiction has very much different set of rules, but as a viewpoint, uh, 
what I have just explained would uh, be a guide for, for yourself to update or uh, setting up a compliance structure as regards the cross-border transfer. Now I will give the mic back to Andrea. Excellent, Akira, thank you very much. Thank you for your moderation. Uh, thanks to all the panelists for sharing with the audience your wealth of knowledge. Um, I, I want to build on, on Akira's comments uh, made just right now. Uh, indeed, uh, the landscape of data privacy internationally is changing by the day. And um, it, in order to keep up with all these changes, it's really important for any company to, to get to uh, Privacy Rules Alliance in order to receive a specific jurisdictional advice from our advisors, from our members in all these countries who are actually interconnected among each other and therefore can advise not only for what is specifically related to one jurisdiction, but actually at global level. So this is definitely the advantage that, that our alliance can offer, which is definitely a competitive advantage for, for all of you in the audience. Um, thank you very much again. I will now pass the floor to Joe Diener, who will be moderating uh, the next panel, and who is also the chairman of Privacy Roots, luckily for us. Uh, so he will be driving us into um, the concepts related to uh, data breaches from the prevention and, and response side. Again, thank you very much for the panelists of the first session who will be still here with us, ready to answer to questions in a question time after this upcoming session. Thank you.